All right. Well, again, I just want to thank everybody. You know, Merry Christmas, Merry Advent, Happy Advent, whatever you want to say, it's all up to you. I prefer Merry Christmas, but really what's important is that we've all got here tonight. You know, that's the fact. We've all made it to Christmas Eve. And I'm telling you, somewhere around March or April, I wasn't really sure about whether I was going to make it or not. I mean, I didn't think that we could. And I know that all the kids in there are still counting down for tomorrow morning. I know that. And I'm still a little kid at heart. But uh, Christmas means a little different to me now at my age than it did when I was a kid. I, I'm much more excited about the meaning of Christmas. And I'm more excited about giving than receiving. But I tell you, I still love Christmas morning. I'm looking forward to my kids coming here tomorrow. And we're opening up our presents. And then we're going down to my mom's house and share Christmas with her. So it can't get here soon enough for me either. I'm right there with you. <laughs> but maybe this is true for you as well as some of the people that are watching online. This has been one heck of a year, hasn't it? And we've said it many times through this series that we've been in, this Advent series. Uh, 2020 has been a different kind of year that I've ever lived through, and probably most of you have ever lived through or even seen. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I really need some Christmas this time of year right now. I'm ready for it. And I think that maybe we need to look around and rediscover what Christmas is really about, what the true meaning is. Because somehow, I think here in the United States and maybe around the world, we sort of lost it in the commercialism. I remember as a kid, you walked into a store and they still had, you know, crosses and mangers and Jesus and some of the toys were still had Christmas themes to them. And you go into most of the stores today, you can't find Jesus. You can find Santa Claus everywhere, but Jesus is hard to find. Yeah. So as most of you know, if you've been here, if you've been on this journey or this odyssey, as I like to say, over the past four weeks through Advent, it's a time of year. And if you've missed any of those messages, you can go to our Facebook and you can watch them there. They're on the Odyssey Church Facebook page as well as my personal Robert Welch of WL Delaware page. But if you want to skip over all my beautiful singing and all the announcements, <laughs> you can go to uh, YouTube and just put in the Odyssey Church channel and we edit all of that out and you just get the message. And we've been talking about what Advent really means. It's the hope that we find in Jesus Christ, the peace we can find in Christ, the joy we find in Christ, the love we can find in Christ. So over the last four weeks, as we've learned, Advent's a season of expectant waiting. And when I was a kid, it was, you know, it was a season of expecting waiting, but it wasn't like it is today for me. You know, I was expecting waiting Christmas, not Christ. And now I'm expecting Christ. And it's also this, as we reflect on, you know, it's also, you know, we reflect on it, we focus on all the things that Jesus sort of brought with him when he came to earth, when he was born, that very first Christmas, that very first advent, so long ago. And we've also talked a lot about the anticipation, because we live in a time of the already but not quite yet. We, we expect when we come and we wait and we celebrate the arrival of his first advent, his first arrival and the birth, but we're in the middle right now. We're, even though he's present with us today, we're expecting him to return. Sometimes I wonder, he's going to go outside and just look to the equal sky and say, Christ, are you ready? Are you coming for your, for your church? But the good news is he's present with us today. So that sort of ties the past, the present, and the future all together. And when he comes back the second time, he's going to complete his work of redemption. And so each week we've been talking about these different topics of God's character that you know sort of embodied or really demonstrated what he brought into our world when he was born when he, and what he lived out through his life as, as his ministry as Jesus the Christ. And I say Jesus the Christ because so often people think Christ is his last name. Christ is Messiah, Savior to the world. He is the Christ. So the hope we have because the promise is fulfilled. We can go back in the Bible in hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born. There were over 300 predictions that, that when he was born were fulfilled and not fulfilled generally. You know, you say, well, he was born, but that could have been this. They were specific. So we can take hope in the fact that we have a God that when he says something, when he promises something, it's going to be fulfilled. And then we have the, the peace of the Prince of Peace, the joy that we can know when we know that, as it says in the book of Nehemiah, that the Lord is our strength. The strength is not in The strength of the joy is in the Lord. It's not in ourselves. And the love we can have, because not only does God love, God is love. Yeah. So 
So we say, you know, so often we, we, you hear somebody say the Christmas story. But I want you to know this isn't a story. I prefer the Christmas account. This was a history. This is historical fact. Whether you want to believe that or not, the, what we read in the scriptures is not a fairy tale. It was written by the people who actually witnessed it, saw it, heard it, or it was written by people who interviewed the people who witnessed, saw it. So Jesus Christ's birth is more documented than any other birth in history, and there were people who saw it. And one time, and not only did they see his birth, his life, and his death, they also saw his resurrection. One time there was a group of 500 people that saw Jesus after they had seen him dead, seeing him alive again. So we have to remember that this is the account of Jesus, it's historical fact, and when we say Jesus, we have to remember that little baby laying in the manger, that is God himself. Like I said earlier, God in a body, so to speak. He came to earth as the most wonderful gift all eternity. Yes. And he did that so that we could live with him for all eternity. So as we walk through these various parts of this, this Christmas account, these past four weeks, it's for sort of how Jesus has intercepted in the lives of very real people who played a very real role in his arrival. And as we mentioned earlier, when Jesus arrived, he brought hope, he brought peace, he brought joy, he brought a love that mankind had never experienced before. He brought it into our lives and tear us in a very, very real way. And the good news is, because you know it can't be gospel unless it's good news, okay. Jesus can do the very same thing for each one of us today. Amen. So in our time together, in this evening, I'm going to briefly chase our, trace the, our way through the portions of the Christmas account um, once again, sort of highlighting all that Jesus uh, Christ has come, and, and we can rediscover you know, maybe about Christmas and rediscover about him in this, this short time. Um, if you don't know, so Advent is Latin for his address. Um, it means coming or arrival. So what we're celebrating is the arrival of Jesus Christ here on earth. And on the church calendar, Advent starts on the fourth Sunday before Christmas. It's always the fourth Sunday before Christmas. And it's actually the first day on a church calendar. The first Sunday of Advent is the first day on a church calendar. And it ends on tonight, on Christmas Eve. So the very best message we had was finding hope in our uncertainties. When uncertainty surrounds us, and there's going to be times, and if you're like my life, there's going to be many, many times when there's going to be uncertainty in your life. The promises of Jesus Christ that were fulfilled in the scriptures can give us hope to carry on in the most difficult times that there are. Sometimes hope is simply the breath which keeps us alive. Without hope, we won't go on. Hope is the fuel of faith. It's the fuel of dreams and possibilities. Hope is the whisper of maybe, just maybe. It's the spark in that cold darkness which catches flame. It's the flicker of the first light in the morning. In the worst sufferings, in the greatest atrocities, in the most horrific catastrophes of human history, there has always remained a flicker of hope. Throughout enslavement, and imprisonment and torture and tragedy there have been those who have clung to hope and that smallest spark of hope would catch it and be fanned within them and eventually it would lead to survival or freedom or release and there are stories all throughout history that you can read uh, that show this in, in people that were in the Jewish concentration camps in Germany and and so many other places where just a flicker of hope kept them going, and, and they were, you know, they came out on the other side. But as we look at uh, the Jewish nation, there was always a hope of God's promise of this Messiah. There was always the hope of God's restoration and His blessing through the Messiah, through the Christ, through the Savior. <clears throat> but time dragged on, and maybe that's the way it is in your life. You know, there's a promise. You know something going on, but but time is dragging on. And for the Jewish nation, you know, it dragged on. The nation became plundered. Its people were exiled. Its people were conquered. And they were, how long, oh God? How long? Have you ever been there? Yeah. How long, oh God? How yeah. long was the cry of these ancient Israel people? It's been my cry of time. And they were year after year and then century after century. But there's always those that kept their hope. They were expectantly waiting. 
They were, they were being obedient. They were faithful. They were trusting openly and wholeheartedly that God would come through with what he had promised. Now, two of those were priests by the name of Simeon and a woman by the name of Anna. And they both got the opportunity to encounter Jesus Christ. They hung on to these promises of God for their entire life. And they had lived long, difficult lives. Yeah. They had known loss. They had known discouragement. But they did not abandon hope. And I want to encourage you, if you're going through something difficult, and it seems like it's been forever, and, and you've come to hope, don't give up. God always keeps his promises. And when they saw the baby Jesus, when he was just about six weeks old in the temple, they knew without a doubt that he was the Messiah. He was the promised one. He was the Son of God. And they were ready. And they were waiting for this moment. Sometimes I wonder if God showed up and, and ready to, to bless me with what I've been praying for. Am I ready? Are you ready for the blessings that you've been praying for? But they were ready and they were waiting for this very moment. And they embraced the moment of hope fulfilled. And they did so with rejoicing and worshiping and spreading the good news. And their flames of hope spread beyond their greatest expectations. They spread beyond themselves. And their hope multiplied to others. Can we do the same thing? So the question I want to ask you this morning, how is the flame of your hope this Christmas Eve? I mean, let's be honest. This has been a difficult year for most of us. Maybe not for everybody, but for most of us, this has been a tough year. This can be the kind of year that threatens to extinguish those flames yeah. of hope. But I want to encourage you. No matter what you're going through, man, no matter what you're facing, no matter where you're at right now, you can rediscover the hope of Christmas and the coming of the Christ child. Yeah. With the arrival of Emmanuel, and Emmanuel means God with us. God has come to restore hope, the hope of salvation, the hope of restoration, the hope of healing, the hope of God's continued work that he will one day with triumphant he will one day fulfill in each one of us, in our bodies, in our souls, and in the world. Yeah. And folks, I don't know about you, but the way I live my life, if God gave me nothing more than salvation, it's much more than I deserve. Mm -hmm. And you know what? It's a free gift. All you have to do is reach out by faith mm -hmm. and receive. So how is the flame of your hope this Christmas Eve? Because God's going to continue working. One day he will complete it in our bodies, in our souls, and in our world. So as we come humbly to worship the Christ, we can find the renewal of his hope. We can find within us the strength to take that next hopeful step and the strength to carry us forward. So I hope that, you know, I want the prayer of the Apostle Paul found in the book of Romans chapter 15, verse 3, to be my prayer. I hope you want it to be your prayer. Let's rediscover hope that Jesus Christ has come and he is working in our lives today, even at this very moment. Paul writes, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace so you trust in him so that you can overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So with that, I'm going to light the first candle in the Advent wreath, the candle of hope. And my finger. <laughs> so that brings us to the second week in Advent, the second Sunday of Advent, and the message that week was one of finding peace in our struggle. Because you know what? It's, it's easy to have peace when everything is going great, isn't it? It's easy to praise the Lord when everything's born and every traffic light's green and you got money in your pocket. But when it comes to the struggles, when the rubber meets the road, that's when it gets tough. And I know from personal experience, the struggles are very real. But I also know from personal experience, the peace of Jesus Christ can transcend or it can exceed or it can suppress what's within us, even in the most difficult times. I've had it. I've felt that. That peace when everything around me looked like it was exploding. And you think about the night of the announcement of Jesus Christ. The, the announcement came in the dark. It came in the middle of the night. And of course, the angels began their message to the separate with the words, do not be afraid. I think the angels got to be scary being But every single time, if you read the scriptures, every time they come to a man and woman, the first words out of their mouth is, do not be afraid. Amen. But, you know, I think about this. Can you imagine? The shepherds were afraid because they were very human. 
But I bet you'd be afraid too if night after night you'd sat under that dark sky and no stars and you watch it and all of a sudden you're sitting there having a cup of coffee with your buddy watching the sheep and the whole sky lights up. This angel comes down and then there's thousands of angels all singing. I'd probably be a little scared too. Yeah. Right after I changed my pants, I saw this. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality is, you know, there's so much in our world which causes us to fear, isn't there? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think most of us would be a whole lot better off if we just turned off news stations and didn't listen to them anymore. Mm-hmm. There's so much which happens that we have to struggle to understand. For the, you know, for the shepherds, this included, you know, these magnificent but still terrifying human, you know, heavenly beings that were showing up in the middle of the night sky. But for most of us, it's just the normal struggles and disappointments and the uncertainties of our imperfection in this broken world. And this is true before we had this uncertain it comes with the event of a worldwide pandemic, COVID-19, a, a virus that we never even heard of this time last year. And look how it's changed our lives. Look how it's changed the world. Look how it's changed how we do business and how we interact with people. But our hope is not in these worldly things. Our hope and our peace come through Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace, according to Isaiah 9, 6. And he arrived here on earth. And sometimes I, I don't think, and I speak as a fool, that the pain of the cross even compared to the pain of Jesus taking off the heavenly robes of infinite being, being everywhere at one place, all knowledge, all knowing, and putting on the limitations of skin. And walk around that for 33 and a half years since before the beginning of time. He, he had access to everything. Now that's love, to give up everything to come. And when he does, he brings us this peace. And when he did, the angels proclaimed this new peace. And, and Luke, Luke, who was a doctor and a historian, he records this uh, event, but he records them from the eyewitnesses of the time that actually saw and actually heard and actually was involved in this. We find it in his gospel in chapter 2, verses 10 through 14. And I'll read this through the New International Version of the Bible. This is the one that we're most familiar with. It says, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in the paws and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly angel host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. And who does his favor rest on? On to those of us who have accepted the free offer of salvation. The favor of God is here with mankind. The peace of shalom, which is a Jewish concept of fullness and safety and completeness and wholeness, is available to each and every one of us it's available tonight. It's available right here. And you don't have to wait for it. This is the peace of restoration with God. Scripture says before Christ we were enemies of God. And now we can be completely restored to him and have peace because of the Savior, the Messiah, who was born. It's the peace which settles our soul so deeply. It's the calm acceptance that it is well with my soul, no matter what kind of turbulence, no matter what kind of storm is surrounding me. In a sense, it's almost like the arrival of Jesus was the eye of a hurricane. And I don't know if you know much about hurricanes, but you, know, you watch them on the news, they are a terrible storm with wind and rain and oftentimes destruction all around them. But in the middle, right in the middle, there's a calm. Right in the eye, it's calm. There's chaos in our world all around us. It turns and it swirls. And it did this before Jesus' life and his ministry. And it still continues today after his life and his ministry here on earth. But it's at almost that night. There was a global pause. There was a just in the night as the angels sang and the ordinary shepherds gathered around a baby who was God. And it's my prayer that we'll all rediscover this peace of Jesus Christ during this Christmas scene, this Christmas season, this, this peace of contented wholeness which provides the eye of the hurricane for our spirits, even in the midst of life's most violent, most destructive storm. 
And some of you are probably there right now. In a crowd this size, it wouldn't surprise me at all if there weren't a lot of you in the woods. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing, the storms will come. I mean, it's one of the promises of Jesus. That, and again, I speak as a fool, I don't like. Jesus said there will be troubles. He didn't say there may be, there could be. You might have some. He said there will be troubles. Here on earth, John chapter 16, verse 33. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. I really wish it said might. But we know this. And maybe right now the winds of these, these trials and sorrows are howling all around you right here in your life right here tonight. But I'm so glad that these words of Jesus neither start with that nor end with that. Chapter 16, verse 33 reads an entire, he says, I have told you this. In fact, he said, I have told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth we will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. So again, I invite you to step into the shelter of the peace of Jesus Christ. Let me encourage you to turn your heart to Jesus, bringing him all your hurt, all your pain, all your prayers. And you know what? Maybe this is not appropriate, maybe it is. You can bring him all your anger because our God has big shoulders and he can take it. And he already knows. So ain't no sense in hiding. Our God loves you with an everlasting love. And he wants you to have that peace in your heart. And he says, just bring it to me. And I'll give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you to let me trust with you. As the Apostle Paul prayed, we could trust with him. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the rediscovery of peace of Jesus Christ in this Christmas season. And now I'm like the candle of peace. Oh, oh, oh. I'm going for the glory of the Lord. It's okay. <laughs> it made me want to surrender more. I don't like it on my fingers. I can't imagine what it would be like to live eternity that way, right? Amen. So that brings us to the third Sunday in Advent. Finding joy in our discouragements. Because we've all been discouraged at times. And when you're down, it's tough to find that joy. You really have to reach down into it. But I can promise you it can be done. And we all have one of those days where things just don't go right. Or maybe one of those weeks. Or for most of us, 2020. Maybe one of those whole entire years. <laughs> when people start asking for toilet paper for Christmas, you know it's trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but even then, even in the midst of our troubles... Jesus Christ can fill us with joy that defies our circumstances. I don't speak this to you because I read it somewhere. I speak this to you because I've been able to live it. I've gone through some horrendous things. And some of you know my testimony. Some of you know what I've been through. But I've been able to find a joy in it. Because my joy doesn't come from my circumstances. My joy comes from my Lord. But you have to allow him to do it. It's not going to come natural. If we learn with Paul, Paul says, I learned to be content. You have to learn to be content. It doesn't come there. But I tell you this, if you do your part, God will do his part. And our part is just simply trusting him for what's best for us. And what's best for us may not be what we think is best for us. Somebody once said God punishes us by answering our prayers. And I've had that happen in my life. So here's the thing, too. We don't think about this all the time. But no matter what you're going through, he knew about it before you knew. And no matter what you're going through, he already knows the outcome, and he'll know that long before you know it as well. And he's taking care of it as he sees fit to draw you closer to him. King David wrote in Psalm chapter 30, verse 5, Weeping may last for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. But folks, I know this. Sometimes that night can feel so long. Sometimes it's night after night after night as we try to carry on. And sometimes, truthfully, happiness and joy, it just feels so elusive and so distant. But when it comes, I mean, sometimes it comes, that joy just pours out of us like an eruption of old faithful. And sometimes that joy bubbles up slowly like a spaghetti sauce on center. <laughs> but we can rediscover this Christmas. The good news of great joy is alive in us through Jesus Christ. And he is the strength of our joy that sustains us. Yeah. See, so often we try to do it on our own. And when we try to do it on our own, almost always we fail. 
You know, sometimes our sin is we ask for things God gives them to them, but it's like an appetite. The more we get, the more we want. So we've seen these stories, and we look at the story of Elizabeth and Mary, and they united the shared joy of their pregnancies. And both their pregnancies were miraculous. For Elizabeth, it was the joy of a, a fulfillment of long dash dreams. She had prayed for a child for years, but now she's old. And, and she's past childbearing years. And because in that culture, not being able to give birth, she was shamed much of her life. So now we have this miracle. She's old, she's past. I mean, and, you know, sometimes I think the miracle is her husband. Because when you're 90 years old, or 100 years old, and your wife is 90, and you say, let's have a baby, <laughs> the miracle is having enough faith to go try it, right? <laughs> her joy had been erased decades, and she'd been to grace for decades. But for Mary, it was different. She was young, but she was in a marriage. She was unmarried, and she was now pregnant with no human way to explain her pregnancy. I mean, what would you do if your girl come home and you said, listen, Mom, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a virgin, but I'm pregnant. And by the way, the baby I'm carrying is God's, and it's the child, it's his son that I'm carrying. After I got her out of the psychiatrist's office, we'd have another call. <laughs> you know, can you, I mean, you just think about it. She's 14 years old, unmarried. How do you explain this? But her joy, her joy came because she she knew there was acceptance from God. There was an understanding. It was a celebration. She was in the middle of God's greatest work, but she had to know what she was facing. She knew her life wasn't going to be easy. She knew she was going to face scorn. She was going to face disbelief, and she's going to, you know, misunderstanding. But is pregnant. But her encounter with with Elizabeth, she finds this great joy. And for some of us, you know, Christmas season is really a, a joy-filled season. You know, we come with the song, and, you know, you people that start before Thanksgiving, I really need to talk to you someday. I'll pray for you guys. <laughs> but, you know, they're filled with songs and celebration and traditions and other comfort. But for other of us, you know, the expectation, you know, these expectations of Christmas joy, they're just not there. You know, for many of us, they serve as reminders of deeper pains of, of parents or children or of loved ones who passed away at this time of year. There's these wide disappointments and the lack of all this merriment that we're supposed to have and supposed to have. And I've seen that a lot this year, unfortunately. I've seen, I've, I've, I've dealt with four or five families who've gone through death a week before Christmas. Uh -huh. Just the day before yesterday, a good friend of mine, daughter, his daughter's a good friend of mine, got diagnosed with third stage cancer and they can't operate. So for sometimes, what's supposed to be a very joyful season isn't so much so. And really, I, I, most of us, you know, there's probably a mixture of both. But it's my hope that we rediscover joy this Christmas season as, as we choose to rejoice. See, that's the thing. It's, it's a mindset. It's a, it's a choice. And we can choose to have joy. And we return. We focus on Jesus. That's how you find your joy. So you focus on him and not your problems. And when you do, you find the strength to get through. We pour out our hearts to him in the midst of our pain. You know, sometimes a good cry is just to make you feel better all over. And when you're crying out to the Lord, you end up just, at the time that you have a peace that, that you just can't explain. The problem's still there, but your heart's different. You've been changed from the inside out. So we return to Jesus. We, we find our strength in him. We pour out our hearts to him, even in the midst of pain. And Jesus can transform our weeping into joy which lets us appreciate and enjoy the goodness of God's greater work within us and in the world around us. So I want to ask you another question this Christmas Eve, and this is an important question. Have you prepared for Christmas, or have you prepared for Christ? And it's important because this is what I know, and what you already know. Most of the world spend a lot more time preparing for Christmas than they do for Christ. We know Christmas is coming tomorrow. Are you prepared? Mm -hmm. The bigger question is, if Christ came tomorrow, are you prepared? Yeah. Because preparing for Christmas really does not give most of us any peace or joy or even love. Preparing for Christmas for most of us is a time of stress, not a time of peace. Yeah. But can you imagine what this world would look like if everybody around the globe prepared for Christ today instead of Christmas? What a different world we would live in. Mm -hmm. 
If you're only ready for Christmas, you're probably not going to feel the peace and the joy and the love God desires you to feel. But if you're not prepared for the Monday morning, if you're prepared for Christ, you can have all these things. You can have the peace. You can have the joy. You can have the love. And it's my prayer. It's written by the Apostle Peter, who was one of Jesus' inner circle, walked with him for three and a half years, considered him to be his friend. And I pray this is going to be your prayer, too. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an expressible and glorious joy. An inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith. The salvation of your souls. And with that, we will light the candle of joy. And that brings us to the last Sunday of Advent. The last Sunday before Christmas. And in that, we were looking at finding love and our differences. And this may have been one of the most important things that we can discuss right now. Because you know, right now, our world, our country, our neighborhoods, they're all divided, aren't they? Mm -hmm. There's so much division in our world. There's so much that drives us apart. And if we really love Jesus Christ as we claim that we love him, our love for him should run deeper than our differences. It should flood us with grace and forgiveness and unity. And you, you know each one of us had this desire in us to be loved, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the desire for love is so dominant in the American culture. Mm -hmm. You know, if future archaeologists and anthropologists, they explore artifacts of air, they're probably going to come to the conclusion that love was one of the most, if not the most important thing that we valued in our society. I mean, just think about it. How many songs do we have? How many movies do we have? How many TV shows do we have? And, and, and all these other things that are just filled with love, especially this time of year. Yeah. I mean, you think about, think about it. I mean, the longing for love, celebrating love, the morning of lost love. I mean, just think about the Hallmark Channel right now. <laughs> Some of you are Hallmark people. I know. I'm, I'm seeing you guys. <laughs> you, know, you know, we're captivated by this love, yeah. but in our humanness, this we struggle with it so badly to love each other on an individual basis or even in a societal basis. And the result is, instead of living in a culture that exemplifies love, we're a nation in a world filled with division and conflict, and as much as I don't like to say it, hatred. And despite our best intentions sometimes, our good, broken human nature still divides us. Jesus, on the other hand, he's the bridge of love that can unite us regardless of our differences. He's the long-promised Messiah that God sent because God loves each one of us so much. He allowed his one and only son to be sacrificed for our sin and our shortcomings. And when he did, Jesus made a way for us to be restored into a relationship with God who not only loved us, but his love himself. Now, with all I've done in my life, if God would find a way for me to come to him and be restored to him, with all the things I've done against him, how much more should I not do that for right. my own enemies? All right. That's right. And I fail at it. I don't want to tell you. I'm trying to be better at it. But when I think about what God has done for me, it's very difficult for me to hold grudges against somebody else. And the best way I've found not to do it is to pray for them. Because if you're praying earnestly for somebody, <coughs> you can't be hating them at the same time. So when you find that person grudging up in your mind, and start feeling that anger bring up. Start to pray for them. And pray for them to have joy. Pray for them to have love. Pray for them to have peace. Even if you don't mean it at the time, because the more you do it, the more you will mean it. I found that in my own life. So as we explored love on our Advent journey, we saw how God gathered a variety of people, a whole group of different people, to be involved in the revival of his son to glorify God the Father. Now what's really interesting, the only people not invited to his were the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees who, who lived by the legalism of the law. But we discovered how these people represented barriers and division, and God was uniting them. They were young and they were old. They were earthly and they were heavenly. They were lowly and they were noble. They were Jews and they were Gentiles. They were clean and unclean. And ultimately, there was God and humanity all united by love and adoration for a Messiah, for a Lord, for a Savior to the world. 
And if we would do the same, how much more could we overcome our divisions of, of racism and politics and money and so many other things yeah. that we categorize? We discovered that Christmas, and it's my prayer that you'll discover Christmas, the love of Christ, the perfect love, which allows us to experience complete acceptance by God himself. And the perfect love, which removes all our fear. Because most of the time, our divisions are really out of fear, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And it's his love it washes over us and it propels within us. That, and I pray it propels us, it fuels us to reach across those divisions around us, even to our worst enemies, with humility and forgiveness and grace. Because God gave us all those things. Yeah. And like the Apostle Paul writes in his letter to the Christians in Ephesus, what we now know is the book of Ephesians, I pray that you be rooting and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, yeah. and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now you think about that. What a love that is. This is our God. This is our Jesus. Yeah. And with that, I'm going to light the candle. And that brings us to tonight, the last day of Advent, Christmas Eve. Finding Christ in our world. Jesus Christ has come with hope, and he's come with peace, and he's come with joy, and he's come with love. Christ has come to change our world and to change us, and not for a short period of time, but for all eternity. Forever and ever. This is his arrival into our world as described by Luke in chapter 2, verse 6 and 7 of his gospel. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available to them. And you think about that. What a humble birth. I mean, such, such an understated beginning to life, except for all of us. It's a normal entry into our existence, isn't it? You know, maybe Jesus came as a little baby because who's afraid of a little baby? You know, Jesus came in a human birth. He, he came as a fragile, helpless baby. And Jesus is now one of us. He understands everything we go through, all of our longings, all of our struggles, all of our pain. And yet Jesus is 100% God, and Jesus is still 100% man. And my finite mind can't understand an infinite God. I, I tell you that. But I know he's our hope. I know he's our joy. I know he's our peace. I know he's our love. He's love personified. He's love demonstrated. He's here to restore these characteristics in us as a byproduct of restored life in our relationship with God. Yeah. Jesus is life rediscovered. And if you're struggling this year, and maybe you're asking, where is Jesus? I just want to offer you this. Jesus is in our uncertainties, and he's in our struggles, and he's in our discouragements, and he's in our differences, and he knew about them long before you did. Where are you from? And he already knows the outcome long before we ever have. Jesus is in both our celebration and our mourning, in our crying and our rejoicing, in our fear and in our triumphs, in our losses and in our victories, in our brokenness and in our healing, in our sickness and in our health, in our life and in our death. And wherever you are, Jesus is there too. Jesus is already there with you. And not only is there, he's working and he's moving and he's offering life and he's offering forgiveness and he's calling us to trust and see beyond our immediate circumstances to his deeper, his bigger, his broader, his wider, his higher picture and his higher and his greater work. Jesus is in our world and Jesus is in our lives. And he is Emmanuel, God with us for all eternity. And he will never leave you and he'll never forsake you. Jesus is the discovery of Christmas. So let's run like the shepherds ran to encounter Jesus this season. Let's worship and find renewal in his presence this year. Let's rediscover Christmas in the light he brings within us and around us. Merry Christmas. Christ has come. Christ is here. Christ is among us. Christ will come again. I'm now going to light the center candle.
Christ people, and as it should be, Christ should be the center of all that we do and all that we say. If we would allow that to happen, not only would our lives change, the lives around us would change as well. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with him, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those whom his favor is. Let's see who we have in here. I'm going to ask uh, Bobby and Amy, if they will, to bring their candles up. And uh, what I'm going to ask them to do is light their candle from the center handle. And Ricky, I'm going to ask you to turn off the lights. And then they're going to go around one to each side. And they'll light the first candle on the first row, and then they'll light the second one. The easiest way to do this, so that you know, is let that person hold their candle straight. And you get their candle from them, and you save wax on your fingers. <laughs> and I'm also want you to. I'm going to ask the uh, teachers, <coughs> racist brother, to come up and uh, play some music on the keyboard. And as the candles are going to be lit, I want you to take notice of something. Both of them took light from this candle, but the candle didn't lose it. In fact, if you look look around, not only did this candle not lose any light, the light has been multiplied and the light has been increased. See, now if we would do the same thing in our world, if we would share the light of Jesus Christ and His hope and His peace and His love and His joy, nothing would be taken away from us, but the light of Christ would be brighter all around us. So as we close and we come to the end of this Advent with the coming of Christ, I want you to keep in mind, we still live in this paradox. Something that seems contradictory. The true of God is here. Repent and believe the good news. But here's the paradox. We live in the already but not quite yet. Jesus Christ has come into the world. His birth, his ministry, his distribution, his resurrection have all taken place and it's been recorded in both secular and church history. The kingdom of God has been established in your heart and in my heart that we're new citizens of an eternal realm. Christ has come into the world in the past, but he lives in us in the present and he's coming back in the future. And because he's coming back, we can experience the joy, the love, the hope that he desires us to have. So we begin with a sing Silent Night as Clifford leads us. And after the song, I'm going to ask you to, to, to please just keep your candles lit. And then we're going to walk into the foil where we'll sing Happy Birthday to our Savior, Jesus the Christ. And then we'll blow out our candles together.
tonight taking time to reflect on the miracle not only Jesus Christ coming into the world but the miracle of Christ coming to our heart sometimes we forget when the Holy Spirit calls us and we receive salvation that's the greatest miracle of all Christ entering into your own heart and how Christ has made you different than you were before let's walk and remember how God has transformed us unto us a child has been born a son has been given let's celebrate Emmanuel 